Hey, what is going on guys out there? This is Jake James Lugo. Welcome to the channel again, and I got a special video for you guys. So hopefully you guys are gonna enjoy this. We're gonna talk about Mortal Kombat. I got my friend here, Timok99. What's going on, my dude? How you been? Hey, how you doing, Jake James? I'm doing good, I'm good, and you welcomed me to your home, which is cool. Funny enough, me and you live like really close to each other, which I didn't realize. Like You live here down here in Florida, and me too as well, so that's pretty dope. Yeah, we're right around the corner from each other. Nice. Who knew? Yeah, right? So it's a small world. <laughs> <laughs> that's so, what's cool about online is you don't know where anybody's from exactly so you go and investigate and look and it's mm -hmm. like hey that's my neighbor he's like oh snap you like games too oh, okay cool so <laughs> but 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 yeah so one of the things that me and you have in common besides where how close we live to each other is mortal kombat we both love mortal kombat as a franchise i mean not so long ago i did the mk Combatpedia video where i was talking with mike who's one of the founders over there so i was like you know what i hit, reached out to you on twitter and i was like why don't we talk about mortal kombat he's like well i live right near you so why don't you just come over and we could talk about mortal kombat i was like okay that sounds pretty dope so since you're a big Mortal Kombat fan on your YouTube channel, you have a ton of MK videos, you run your own website, you do a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, on Twitter, you have a whole bunch of Mortal Kombat related media on there. Tell me a little bit about where your fandom started, or at least what Mortal Kombat really means to you. Well, um, gosh, those are two different questions. I could <laughs> talk about it all day. I've been into Mortal Kombat since the very first one came mm. out. Uh, when it came out on the home systems, it was released on the Sega Genesis, and uh, some neighbors of mine... They rented the game, and I'd seen the commercials on TV, but I hadn't really, you know, I've seen the strategy guides at the toy store and, and stuff yeah. like that, but I hadn't really checked it out. So they rented the game from Blockbuster, and uh, that shows you how, how long ago this was. Nice. And they had the blood code. Like, mm. everybody just knew it was Everybody AB. knew that. Yeah. Like. A, B, A, C, A, B, B. Like, we still know it to this day if you're exactly. an old school Mortal Kombat fan. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had the blood code, and we were just, we played it all night long. Nice. And, yeah. and that just, it just splurred out from there. Yeah, I was hooked. I was hooked. You know, I went to the arcades and, and checked it out. And, you know, any fans who are getting into it now, if they compare the arcade version and the Sega Genesis version, yeah. they're obviously very different. The arcade's way well and above it. But yeah. at the time, you don't really notice that stuff. Because when you play it in the arcades, there's always sound effects and music from other games drowning it out. Definitely. So the Genesis version seemed like a very faithful translation. And it was great at the time. Much different than the Super Nintendo, obviously. Because yeah. of the blood. That yeah. was a big thing. That was a huge thing, not only in the creation of the ESRB, but also just in, like, you know, the conversations one would have in the playground. I remember that vividly to this day, you know, just talking with people about different games that you were playing. And one of the big things in the console wars back then, which more version of Mortal Kombat were you down with? And everybody was pretty much down with the Genesis version. Because that was the one... That was the more edgy one that was like you were like Definitely. oh you're playing something you're not really supposed to play you know away from your parents and such but funny that you mentioned that arcade version did you really have a lot of time spent with the arcade version back in the day or is it really more the console version that was your jam um for me with mortal kombat 1 it was definitely the console version that's how i was introduced to it mm -hmm. and then once we got into mortal kombat 2 i would i would go to the arcades and play it there mm -hmm. and then you know when i came out when it came out on the home systems then that's it. You stopped going to the arcades until Mortal Kombat 3 comes out. And then with Mortal Kombat 3, that's where it started to get really good. Mm -hmm. That's where I was, you know, I was like a 14-year-old kid or something like that, having a couple quarters, beating the game and drawing, like, crowds of people to the arcade and just feeding off that energy. It's just an unbelievable experience. People today who play, and if their only experience is playing online with people and net play and stuff... They don't know that feeling that you got in the arcade when you're with when you're with somebody. It's a totally different dynamic. Yeah. I mean, again, the competitiveness that's one big thing. Mm -hmm. The the sounds, you know, the atmosphere amongst other people that's around you. That that I remember even you know getting away from Mortal Kombat related really, to Street Fighter. That was like a very big similarity that a lot of people loved about that scene, especially the origins of the fighting game community, the origins of just fighting games as a genre. In yeah. General. I mean, all that arcade games way back when, but still, all arcade games had this, but fighting games especially definitely. And Mortal Kombat had no shortage of that. It was just great to go over there you get a crowd of people maybe you're playing against someone else and you know his friends are cheering for him your friends are cheering for you there's just something about that that you can't really replicate online now one of the things i always loved a little bit more about the console versions of mk you know specific if we're talking just strictly mk1 now as a mm -hmm. beginning uh for me it was more that mortal kombat besides playing with like another person there it was a lot more of a personable experience you know mm -hmm. on the console specifically whether it was genesis or super nintendo and the arcade ver the arcade version was just that you know atmosphere was a lot more sociable and I always felt like you couldn't really kind of, you know, have an appreciation for certain aspects about the game when you were within that atmosphere in the arcade. I mean, obviously, there's the blood, there's the violence, there's the, the competitiveness and stuff. But then when you start playing the console version, at least for me, you start noticing other stuff, you know, about the lore, the, yep. the world, yep. the character design, mm -hmm. or the level design. Because at least one of the things that I loved about Mortal Kombat that set it apart from Street Fighter was the characters. 
was the the setting the 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 whole nature of it being kind of like a shaolin you know uh kung fu movie like almost like a b movie to an extent while street fighter seems a little bit more anime at the time i mean was it the same for you back then well absolutely because when you look at street fighter it had cartoon it was hand-drawn graphics when you had mortal kombat they used digitized sprites they'd actually videotaped people they filmed them and the difference was like night and day now they're all 3D. You know, yeah. now now that what made Mortal Kombat unique and what made it distinct from every other game out there, it doesn't really have that when, when everything's 3D. Hmm. But at the time, yeah, definitely. That's what made Mortal Kombat stand out. But not only that, but the gameplay too. Hmm. Because when you're talking about Street Fighter, you know, every single projectile is basically a fireball, right? It, one person shoots it out, the other person gets hit, that's it. Yeah. There's, despite how they might make it look, they all work the same way. But in Mortal Kombat, you've got the freeze... You've got the spear, you know, which makes them dizzy for a second. You've got, like, the force ball, which makes them trip forward over the projectile. You have all these crazy things, especially in the later ones, like when they gave Rain the, the, the one that lets them move the player all around. Yeah. And, and uh, Noob Saibot's ghost ball, where they just can't attack you and they can't block and just, you know, the disabler. The, all, all this crazy stuff. Mortal Kombat had a lot more creativity, I feel like, when it went into the special moves. I think also you, you have to give a lot of credit to Street Fighter before the fighting genre because obviously that was something that helped spawn a lot of other fighting, including Mortal yeah. Kombat. I mean, yeah. include, all the way straight down throughout the ages into mm-hmm. the years, I should say, to like 3D fighters and stuff. There's a lot of the, the basic mechanics and the basic philosophies of the fighting game genre kind of like, you know, stemmed from Street Fighter, specifically Street Fighter 2. With Mortal Kombat, which I always thought was interesting, is like you mentioned, a lot of the properties of the special moves work differently. I mean, you had projectiles, you had grapples, and you had other stuff in Street Fighter. But then, once you get into later games that came after that, like Mortal Kombat, like, uh, was it Killer Instinct, so, you know, Bloody Roar, etc., they, they, people started to play around with the mechanics of the genre. And I always felt like, with Mortal Kombat, again, you had Scorpion Spear, you know, in the first mm-hmm. MK. You yeah. obviously had projectiles, you had flying moves that were more physical moves, very similar to like what you would find like DJ stuff in Street Fighter or even anything like the Dragon Punch in uh, Street Fighter. It's stuff like that, but in a much more different setting. But also, more importantly, the way that it controlled. Uh, with Mortal Kombat, you had a lot of directional inputs and button inputs. So it was like down forward, whatever, or down back, whatever, anything of the sort. With Street Fighter, it was more quarter circle motions. And Street Fighter also had a lot of this, let me hold back for two seconds exactly. and then forward the charge and a punch. Moves. Yeah, which Mortal Kombat never did that. They did have where you would like charge high punch for a couple seconds or something But like it was never that. a directional stuff. Like. Right. Yeah, well, and, you know, when you when you got really into Street Fighter, when you got really into Mortal Kombat, when you played the hell out of both of those games and you really understood the difference, um, that's where I come down and, and I prefer Mortal Kombat. I know a lot of other people in the community may prefer Street Fighter, and that's cool, too. But, um, you know, at least it comes from a place where we played both, we experienced both. And I think it's, you mentioned other games in the genre, like... Um, Killer Instinct and Primal King Rage. King of Fighters is another yeah. one. It's like very similar to Street Fighter. I mean, you, there's a whole bunch of fighting games within within that 90s period because ever since Street Fighter Mortal Kombat came out, there was that big boom of like mm-hmm. a lot of copycats. Yeah. Uh, War Gods on N64. Again, the list goes on. Yeah, no, there were, there were so many games in that uh, in the genre, but really how many of them have held up? Exactly. You know, Killer Instinct just came back out after all this time, after mm-hmm. a huge hiatus. But Mortal Kombat has that staying power and Street Fighter has that staying power. And I think... Uh, Tekken has that staying power, but not too many that I think really consistently over the years have, have been delivering. Now, you know what I think that is due to? Not only the lore, the worlds that they build, but the unique characters. I think a lot of, with yeah. Street Fighter, it's more of the archetypes. With Mortal right. Kombat, it's almost kind of like a parody of a lot of those archetypes, or at least borrowing <laughs> from other elements from yeah. other media. Like Mortal Kombat, I, in one of your videos, you were talking about uh, Liu Kang, and obviously parody straight up of Bruce Lee. Yeah. Like, almost a carbon copy. Unapo- unapologetically. unapologetically. <laughs> like, straight up. I mean, same thing with Fei Long and Street Fighter. Unapologetically, it's Bruce Lee in that game. But... And uh, Tekken Com- had that too, right? Yeah, with, with martial, martial law. law. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then other franchises like Dead or Alive, Jan Lee. And again, it go, they, every game... There's always the Bruce Lee There's archetype. always that Bruce Lee yeah. character. Even in Soul Calibur. Like, up to this point, Maxi with the nunchucks. Like. But, but I think your point here was that Mortal Kombat borrows way more from... It, like, pokes fun at a lot of the different stuff. A lot of the archetypes. Yeah. I mean, you got, you know, that... that that uh was it that Shaw Brothers S type of like you know character in Raiden you know he's like he's that that chop suey kung fu type of like character yeah. that you find in like those classic 70s big trouble in little food. china exactly mm-hmm. you know different stuff like that and I find there's a little bit more parody there even though it's still taken kind of seriously in Mortal Kombat and it builds up this lore that's completely different it's like a different flavor of fighting game when compared between the two but also keep in mind I think it's just that some of those characters were so like over the top in just the way that they were designed their personalities so their moves and then obviously the fatalities which played a huge part into the game being successful was really why that franchise lasted so long because that was the things that you would remember the most 
for Mortal Kombat. Yeah, well, and that's the thing, too. Is Mortal Kombat was really the first um, fighting game to have fatalities. Mm -hmm. And Ed Boon has said he was inspired by Street Fighter, the whole dizzy thing, when you beat somebody up too much and, exactly. and they get dizzy. But he hated that because when you're the guy trying to come back and now you can't, you're at a disadvantage. So he said, let's just take that and move it to the end. And then mm -hmm. it sort of became, well, let's do a, an extra special move here, like kind of the exclamation point. Like, yeah, I won the two rounds. Let me do something extra special. And then it, fatalities came out of that. Those finishing moves. Yeah, They're pretty dope. And now, then and then Killer Instinct kind of borrowed from that too. They have true. killer, they have uh, fatality moves there as well, and and there are other ones too. I think Primal Rage has Primal Rage definitely. Uh, Eternal Champions and Sega Genesis. That, yeah, that's another, that's another one that's like really obscure Sega, for a lot of you guys out there. Sega like, Genesis exclusive. So you, you know, yeah. a whole bunch and of games and CD. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So there, there, there's a lot of different games that borrowed elements from a lot of those franchises, especially Mortal Kombat. Now. Let's talk about Mortal Kombat 2. Mortal Kombat 2 is one of my favorite games of the franchise. And I think yeah, you also too. have an appreciation for it as well. Yeah, I think Mortal Kombat 2 is the best of the franchise. I, I'm going to say that out right now. Even, even the newer games, yeah. as good as they are, as much as I love story mode, as much as I love to see what's going on, Mortal Kombat 2 is always going to have a special place in my heart. For me, I always felt it was the height of the series because it took yeah. what was established in the original and it built upon it in a really good way. And mm -hmm. not only the presentation, the amount of characters, the moves, the yeah. lore, the story. A lot of that different stuff I felt was improved upon now. When it got to later to like Mortal Kombat 3, Ultimate 3, and then beyond that, I felt like they got a little bit too crazy with a lot of gimmicky stuff. Like I never, I was never a fan of the combo system in, in, in K3. That's why I loved Mortal Kombat 2 so and much. And that sort of came so from basic. Killer Instinct, that, that yeah. combo system was sort of borrowed from there exactly and it's just i never i never it never really latched on with me and i never kind of you know latched onto it and i felt like it whether it was harder to do because i know some of the inputs in mortal kombat 3 could be a little bit difficult especially those combos yeah. the brutalities a lot of that stuff gets a little bit ridiculous in some instances the brutalities i think starting with ultimate with trilogy were the probably the most difficult hmm. but you know to be fair um the developers have this problem in all creative endeavors yeah. uh, the entire entertainment industry they have this thing called sequelitis where you want to keep giving the fans what they know. You want to stay true to what you have. But yet, you don't want to make it feel like it's the same old thing over and over again. So what do you do? Eventually, you're going to have a sequel that either feels too rehashed or too different from what it was. Mm. And with Mortal Kombat 2, they didn't really have that problem yet because this is the first sequel. So mm. they can kind of take it in almost any direction and it'll be, it'll be okay. But Mortal Kombat 2 hit that sweet spot. I did. I think so. I mean, again, I love a lot of the characters in that game. I love a lot of the moves. I yeah. mean, I felt like that yeah. was the pinnacle of like that type of design of that type of game. And I, it was fun. It was a fun mm -hmm. experience, especially in the arcades. I mean, again, it took a lot of the sounds, a lot of the moves, a lot of the crazy effects improved upon it. Yeah. There's obviously stuff that's in the arcade version that's not in the console versions. I remember for me, it was the Genesis version of mm -hmm. MK2. And granted, the Super Nintendo and Genesis were more similar this time around when they, when that game came out. You know, Super Nintendo finally had blood. Uh, Nintendo learned their lesson. Yeah. Yeah, you know, time. with MK1, um, it outsold on the Sega Genesis like 4 to 1 compared Definitely. to Super Nintendo. And in some places, 8 to 1. So Nintendo said, hey, if we want to make money on this next game, we're going to have to allow a claim to put blood in the game. I think a lot of that was the product of the time. I think also mm -hmm. a lot of that was a cause and effect of the ESRB. Because granted, Mortal Kombat was the reason why the ESRB was created. Or at least one of the big reasons why. One of the besides, main ones. Besides like Night Trap and all these other games that were out at the Night time. Night Trap was a, a little bit more obscure. And then mm -hmm. Doom was the other big one. Which but it was, was really MK. The MK was yeah. the one that I saw that was the main one. a lot of people latched onto. But the reason being why that was such a big deal is because also this was like constantly the public or the government like saying like oh you can't you know these are bad things or whatever and it just piqued everybody's curiosity more and it's just like it made everybody just get a little bit more excited about stuff like Mortal Kombat and then we it got does. the movie around the yep. same time frame you know after MK2 came out which was cool I always thought that was dope uh, and yeah, well, the movie and the and the ESRB the and all this stuff happening all at once. Yeah, it was just um, perfect recipe for for Mortal Kombat success. Exactly, and uh, and and I think it's I think the second movie came out around like MK three or MK four, right? Like somewhere around that time frame. Yep. I get the dates mixed up, but like uh, a lot of that stuff again. It, once you started getting to the later games, I felt like things started to get a little bit more gimmicky. They started to get caught up on, obviously, the animalities, mm -hmm. the brutalities, a lot of the different stuff that made things more complex. And I felt like the complexity of it was some instances were not needed. Like, obviously, the finishing moves, the friendships, the babalities, the fatalities, all that different stuff I thought was cool. And that's like a level of complexity. It's like, as, if you know those type of things, you get a little bit of extra oomph for your game. But with, you know, the, the combo system and the running in the combos and stuff like that, I always felt I was like, you know what? Whether it was because I couldn't do it or because obviously I just thought, you know, it was a little bit too crazy and such. It just was never one of those things that I ever kind of latched onto. No, a lot of the game design and a lot of the choices that they made was, it was done out of a sense that we need to build some buzz and we need to build some excitement. And how do you do that? So they made the animalities so complex, right? Like 
you have to do a, it has to be in the third round so that you can do a mercy and then you can do the animality input. Hmm. So like if you're just some bystander and you're watching, the first time you see an animality, that means that's probably the first time you've seen a mercy too. Hmm. So then you've got all kinds of ideas going on in your head. Like what is this? They've got mercies, they've got animalities, just how much stuff is hidden in this game? Hmm. And um, it was the same thing with Mortal Kombat 2. You know, when, when you first saw Mortal Kombat 2, right? And you saw maybe a stage fatality for the first time. That, as someone who was familiar with Mortal Kombat 1, and now you're seeing what they're doing with Mortal Kombat 2, it's like, whoa, there's stage fatalities? The stage fatalities were dope. That was awesome yeah. in Mortal Kombat 2. I mean, granted, we had it in MK1 with the with the pit. Yeah, with the pit. But, but like, you know, then you had the the acid pit, then you had the pit 2. Yeah, then you had the, the, the one with the needles and, and like, that... Uh, the red stage. I don't the remember. The combat tomb. The combat tomb. Okay. Yeah. Well, there was that. I mean, and then you also what, which is what I really wanted to get to. Secrets. In, yeah. In the all secrets. in all the games, the Ed Boone and crew are always nice when it comes to actually including goodies in their games. Like Tons. whether it's whether Tons. it's extra characters you can't play as that are like, what the hell is this? Or extra little fun nods, joking things. I always thought they had such a great sense of humor for like extra stuff to reward players for spending so much time and putting their fandom into something that they loved. Yeah, well, especially when they got into like Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance and oh, they yeah. started having the crypt and they started having all these crazy things like cooking with scorpion. Yes, cooking with scorpion <laughs> right here. That was the one of the best extras they've ever done because it's just so damn funny and ridiculous. Like it's re- insane. Yeah, and and a lot of the humor was just so bizarre. Like you know Dan Forden cupping out of the corner and going toasty. It's yeah, like, that. whoa, what is what is this? And just so random. <laughs> but and the, even. Even the simple stuff, like even just the fact that characters had two fatalities, hmm. that was amazing because you'd go to the arcade and you would see someone do a fatality or whatever, and you, you, the next time you go and you see them do something different, it's like, wait a minute, I could have sworn his fatality was something else. Hmm. Like, did I get it wrong? Am I confusing the fatalities? Or do they actually have two? If they have two, then how many could they have? Like, every time you see something new in that game, just you, you're, the possibilities in your mind just seemed like infinitely more than what it, what it actually was. Your imagination just kind of took it and, and ran with it. There's just so I'm much I'm sure that stuff. was your experience, too. Uh, for, to some extent, I mean, like, obviously, one of the big things, especially with the console version, everybody looked up cheat codes. This was the early days yep. of the internet. You yep. know, it cheat codes, it was like, you know, that, that Resident Evil 4 dude that was like, hey, what are you buying? You know, that type of thing where it's like on the hush-hush. And, like, and immediately, as soon as you started, like, you know, talking about stuff like that, it was like something you weren't really supposed to talk about it, but a bunch of people knew. It, at least that's how it was in the playground back in the day. But... Yeah. One of the things, like I said, that that I really love about Nether, well, now Nether Run, but back then it was Midway, Midway, and, yep. and the team and the whole MK team, they really just love putting a lot of little extra details, little extra goodies into their games. It was all like that throughout MK One, Two, uh, Three, especially when you had, especially Ultimate Three. There were so many characters, then there was other characters that you you could find and discover in some case. Uh, there was obviously the bosses, Shang Tsung, uh, uh, was it uh, Goro? Uh, Kintaro, Shao Kahn, and later you know, Motaro, Motaro, yeah. all those characters that were just utterly insane as far as like you know being boss fighters now granted in other fighters of the in the, in the genre of the game street fighter especially king of fighters is notorious for having crazy boss fights right you know, or crazy like final like boss fights mm-hmm. that you could get mm-hmm. mortal Kombat is this, uh, very similar but there was always like that one little thing that was kind of like made things easy i remember i think it was with shao Kahn. i can't remember if it was part two or part three where you could either jump back or duck and just get like a free uppercut against them at one point yeah something like that along those lines but, but there's like always all things. these secrets like mm-hmm. it, if you if you played for a long time or if you see someone else who's playing and maybe you pick up on it and you can incorporate it into your own strategy. Like, I remember just experimenting with uh, Sub Zero mm. and fighting Goro. And uh, this might be just on the Super Nintendo, but you'd freeze Goro, and then you can do a foot sweep on him, and he doesn't get unfrozen. So you can do another foot sweep on him, and you can get like two or three or and four. And they keep doing damage. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah, he keeps reducing the life bar, so you can kind of keep doing that before he wakes up and gets out of it. Those exploits. Like, there's a set. Those are like little things like that I always thought I appreciated. Because yes. like you didn't know about it unless like, there's somebody told you or you accidentally discovered it, which I always thought was fun about Mortal Kombat. Well, the bosses are really intimidating. You mm-hmm. know, when you see somebody like Kentaro, it's like, oh, geez, how am I going to beat like, this Like, he's guy? huge. Like, right. Or Mortar, Mortar was a huge sprite on the screen Giant. compared to your little dude, like, right here. It's like, okay, like, this is going to go well. Like, like he doesn't even <laughs> really fall down all the way motaro he's sort of always up <laughs> and you can't even finish them that that's what i always thought was like almost yeah. insulting to uh-huh. what and they probably right. knew what they were doing too it was like well guess what you could defeat him but you kind of can't kill him it's like and you know it's like <laughs> come on like i could do this to everybody in the game I and you wonder point. how much of that is because 
There's limitations, like uh, Goro is bigger, and so if you did try to do the finishing move, it, the sprites wouldn't line up right. Probably. And how much of that was just, let's make this guy so intimidating that you can never really get rid of like, him. Like, he's such a badass. Yeah. That, he, that, that this is, like, his perk for being such, a, like, a final boss or a non-playable character. Like, again, Shao Kahn's the same thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, granted, Shao Kahn, when you defeat him, like, he, it goes through that whole sequence right before their epilogue. Or yes, yeah, it's, like, it's an amazing reward sequence mm -hmm. for, for uh, killing the boss. Same thing with Shang Tsung, actually. Mm -hmm. With Shang Tsung, he... You know, is like losing the souls of all yeah. the people, of all the other combatants. That's cr it was crazy. Just these ending sequences they made. Now, Mortal Kombat three had like this little thing. Well, Ultimate three, because at least I'm going based off of Ultimate three from the Sega Genesis version I had back in the day. And it had this thing like when you would win, you would have like that little selection of like different stuff. And I always remember yeah. choosing the skull and get the demo of like all the fatalities, the supreme all, fatality, the supreme demonstration. fatality demonstration, yes. which I always thought was so cool because granted you would see something that you never saw before. And I thought that was always so much fun to look at. Or again, the little Galica mini game or some random mm -hmm. like you know mini game mm -hmm. that they would have in there. They were always doing stuff like that that I appreciated. Yeah, when they made that that uh, tre you know choose the treasures of Shao Kahn screen. I remember always wanting to do something different. Like, I used to just like to beat the game and then watch the ending and see what uh, what happens if this guy wins. You know, what's his story? The endings are like a what if. So you get to see what do they do once they beat the boss. And then when they started adding something else, it's like, well, if you don't watch the ending, you get to this other reward. Maybe you'll fight a secret person that you didn't know yeah. about. Or maybe you'll see um, fatalities or play a mini game, like you said. There's just all kinds of hidden stuff. And there were so many of them, you'd almost like want to grab a pencil and paper and write down, okay, let me see what each one of these single things does. And then compare notes with other people that are probably doing the exact same thing. Yeah, exactly. So let's talk about the later games. Let's talk about going into the PlayStation 2 era. Because granted, Mortal Kombat 4, Mortal Kombat Gold, you know, very similar to mm -hmm. some of the older games, similar to 3 or whatnot. And mm -hmm. I feel like things start to change when you go from Deadly Alliance onward. Now, for well, me... Well, with Mortal Kombat 4, because you're skipping past it real quick. True, <laughs> true. They did that uh, Mortal Kombat 4 road tour. Yeah. Which... I went on that, so I was oh, very really? happy. Yeah, I went. Uh, I got to see the Mortal Kombat 4, like the beta stage, mm. before there was, you know, before anybody really had gameplay of it or anything, before anyone could really try it out. Nice. So now there's footage on YouTube that I made it available so that you can see what Noob Saibot was like. Mm. Um, not the best or most exciting footage of him playing, <laughs> but uh, he's there. He was. They took. They put him in the Road Tour version, then they took him out of the main version. He came back later. For the home systems, but it wasn't the same as, as in the road tour. No, it's a nice little relic of time, a little yeah. little little time capsule there. But the reason yeah. why I say that is because I always felt like once Deadly Alliance, Deception, and Armageddon came around, that's when the series really changed for me. And for yeah, a lot of time. other people, big time big now, time. design wise, the way the fighting played out, it was still Mortal Kombat in 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 essence. It was still yeah. about violence, still about the fatality. It's all about sure. the world, the characters. But like the gameplay is what really changed it. It was fundamentally a different game. And I was some that was some critics some critics felt that it was a fighting game with just Mortal Kombat skins on it. Yeah, like some people thought they they took it too far because you didn't have uppercuts, mm -hmm. so they put them back in Mortal Kombat Deception. You know, they listened to what the fan base was saying, and I think with Deception they really got it right. When you're talking about the 3D era, um, they had like two fighting styles, and then the two hand to hand fighting styles and one weapon fighting style. I think it was Deadly Alliance. They Alliance. had three. They had they had two fighting one one, one weapon. weapon. Yes. And then I think Deception was the same thing. And same then thing. Armageddon was just one and one. I think. I yeah, play. because you had too many characters. Yeah, exactly. You had a lot more. They, you was, they were building upon it as they went around. And even then, I still feel like uh, in, in Deadly Alliance, there were still uppercuts, but it was like just different inputs. They were just like different characters, different moves. I'm know. not sure if every character had one, or maybe... Like, I remember Kenshi. Maybe they like had Jack one triangle. in... triangle. Maybe they had I mean, them back in... square, I mean. Like, but only in one fighting style, right? Yeah, in one fighting style, exactly. Yeah, and, and the thing about Mortal Kombat was always how simple and accessible it was. Exactly. And it's like, look, down and high punch is an uppercut. Every single character, every single time, it was always the same. For, for every Mortal Kombat, even in mythologies. Even they kept those gameplay mechanics exactly. the same. So with Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance, when they changed all the inputs around, uh, some Mortal Kombat fans had a really hard time getting into it. So, you know, but I thought it was great. I thought it was a lot of fun. Sure. But it was different, and you got to know going into it. It's it's like goes back to that thing we talked about earlier, sequelitis. Definitely. Now, one of the flip sides of that that I thought was like a really big positive was that now they had the opportunity to introduce or at least add more other extra elements to it because you got all the extra goodies. You got the crypt. Yep which was huge in all those games, which is yep. awesome because you get all that extra kind of like, you know, pre-production stuff. You got those little extra joke stuff like cooking with Scorpion. Mm -hmm. You got the ability to unlock extra outfits. You got the ability to, to, to look at like little, like small little videos or demos and stuff. Or even little random pictures. Yeah. Like this is Sue House Heart. And mm -hmm. by the way, this is the surgeon that did it worked for the Chinese military. Like all these, all these crazy back details that you don't even get in the bio. Mm. And that's another thing I liked is that when they had an alternate costume, the characters had an alternate, alternate bio. bio. Exactly. Yeah, so, you know, if you look at all the bios and you think you know the story, 
you don't know the whole story. Now you got to go and unlock their alternate costumes, and then you can get the full story once you see their endings too. Now, what I also thought was cool too when they started getting into Deception, I think it was yeah, it was Deception and, De- and Armageddon where all of a sudden now from what they had their bases on in De- in a Deadly Alliance, then they started implementing the stage kills. I think yep. it, was, it was in Deception yep. where there was those, like those instant stage kills where like you would win the a death round. traps. The death traps, yeah. Yes. And, and I remember some people hated those. They, they they were really opposed because obviously it was like the the ring outs and like Soul Calibur or a Virtual Fighter. Yeah, I actually like, was a fan though. Really? I actually liked I mean this. I mean it's cool to see you know a different yeah. way to kill your opponent. But I mean I can understand you know coming from a competitive side where it's like okay you win a round automatically if like you push them right into it or especially if you start off a round like that. I can understand that's a pain. Well, to play. you know. That's just something you have to take into account when you're yeah. learning how to play the game. Uh, the Falling Cliffs had was the one stage where both players at the same time could fall out of the arena and land on a spike, and they were both gone. And it was like a tie. That you know that they you could always have a tie theoretically, especially with timeouts. But hmm. but with the death traps, that was it created a unique experience. And you know it was still Mortal Kombat. It yeah. was still within the you know the personality of the franchise for sure. Now one of the other cool things also is that they, they had those little kind of like environmental things where yeah, I guess you could say it's like the basis for the environmental stuff. Like the weapon. Now. The weapon that yes. you could pick up that wasn't really a weapon style. To the character. It was just like a, some random thing you could pick up and use against for a very brief time I think it was. Mm-hmm. Or like I think it was like a couple hits something like that. It's been years. But it was just like an extra little thing that was still within the personality of the franchise but it was still something new it was still something that they were trying out for better or worse worked out or didn't work out but it was still kind of fun now one of the other things though at least in that time period of the franchise the aesthetic I still think like the jump to 3D I thought was very good yeah. for Mortal Kombat granted that was still within Mortal Kombat 4 Mortal Kombat Golds but with Delhi Alliance onward I felt that's when it really started to look good granted the designs got a little bit more crazier especially mm-hmm. you know both the male and the female designs but also I felt like that was also a good way for the for the actual series to tell its story really well and have this really good coat of paint on it yeah especially when you got into the things like uh, with Mortal Kombat Deception they had that whole open 3D world with conquest mode yeah, where conquest. you were shooting Go. and and then finding the kami dogus yeah. yeah exactly like those were dope i mean that was a cool that was a cool extra mode on top of already the combat and everything else but uh you know some people i think spent more time in the conquest mode then because, than the game <laughs> yeah because it was so fun to like well if i go behind this tent and you know between three and four a chest of gold will show up and then disappear right afterwards and they had the whole meditation thing so you could kind of let the time go forward if that's what you were trying to do. It got really complex. I yeah. remember, I remember having to go online and look up all this just to find all the extra outfits on all the characters yeah. and whatever else that I needed. That, that I felt like at times got a little bit too overly complex. And I think they maybe addressed some of that stuff in Armageddon later on. But I think it was still kind of like the same thing. Well, yeah, because with Armageddon, they kind of made it easier to get some of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, like a big thing was when you started a file in Mortal Kombat Deception and you wanted to start Conquest Mode... And Shujinko got to be as old as he is, and he you know explored all the realms. That's it. You can't really start over. You can't really go into the village. So with Armageddon, when they had the new one now with Taven, and you're trying to, uh, you know, you have that whole competition with Dagon and uh, the whole thing with the dragons, right? Now when you get to the end, you get to start over, and you don't have to create a new file to do it. So new they, game plus, basically. Almost. Yes, it was great. It was just just do it as much as many times as you need to to get all the relics. Definitely. Now also. Those extra little mini games, especially in Deception. Yeah. Combat chess. Yes. Puzzle combat. I mean, all that stuff. I'm a, yeah, it was puzzle combat. It was the one that looked like Tetris. Yeah. yeah. So like, that, that stuff, to me, I was, thought was fun. It was stupid. It was ridiculous. But it was just so much fun. I think Armageddon had the, the kart racing. Yeah, they point. had that motor combat. The motor combat. It was just insane, stupid ideas that just somehow were just goofy distractions. Well, and you know what I loved about that puzzle combat was um, there was another game that had already been out, I think. It was on Game Boy Advance called Super Puzzle Combat 2 Turbo. Oh, yeah, for the Street Fighter? Yeah, it was, it was the exact same game as Puzzle Combat, really. Mm-hmm. The same same exact rules and stuff like that, just mm-hmm. with Street Fighter chibis instead of Mortal Kombat. Yeah. But it was kind of a neat nod to, you know, I felt that was a nod to what Capcom was doing with their franchise. Definitely. I mean, again, just going up, comparing the two franchises, comparing the two companies, stuff, I always felt that Capcom really focused, you know, intensely on building up their foundation for their game, their fighting system, and all that stuff throughout all their games and such. Mm-hmm. But but I felt like with MK, they always had that ability or at least that willingness to go out and experiment with a lot of their stuff. You got those types of mini games like the puzzle combat, like the car combat, or, or the combat chess, or any of that stuff. You never saw that at all, hardly at all with Street Fighter, besides the pu- Super Puzzle Fighter. And right. even then, it was it was like a totally separate entity. It wasn't really connected to their... It wasn't game. really like a bonus, the way mm-hmm. the Midway team gave everybody bonuses at the Mortal Kombat. Um, yeah, that's something that I think they did really well. Like, in the arcades, 
you know, they I think from the beginning with Mortal Kombat 2, they snuck in Pong as mm-hmm. as a bonus if you get 250 wins. And with Mortal Kombat 3, they snuck in Galaga, like if you have a combat code. Now, on the consoles, when, when Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance came out, that was designed for the console. So the idea of how they would hide the games, it was a completely different approach. Definitely. You know, and, and giving you a crypt and letting you access everything from a main menu and making it easier for the fan to to retrieve some of this stuff. It was brilliant. Nice. Now, let's talk about more modern combat games, which is MK9, yeah. MKX, XL, yeah. etc. That's now where we are right now at this point in time Definitely. when we're recording this. So, uh, overall, how do you feel about the reboot? For me, I thought it was needed. I think it was a good way for them to start over because yeah. a lot of people, especially after Armageddon came out, they weren't re- they they were fans of the series like yourself, like me, mm-hmm. but you know, Overall, the grand, you know, grouping of people in the game industry, you know, people that that really uh, just consumers and stuff, they weren't really feeling Mortal Kombat as they were back in the day. And the reason why I say that is because things like Street Fighter 4 happened, you know, that right. totally rebooted the fighting game genre. And that really kind of got people nostalgic and anticipating, like, you know, to see a lot of their other fighting franchises come back. And I thought it was good for how Mortal Kombat approached it because they went back to a little bit more of a traditional take on that formula. Okay, mm-hmm. a little bit more modernized, but still traditional ideas, you know, pulling from like MK2, MK3 specifically, I think. And, you know, really bringing it into the modern day where it was still, it still felt like classic combat, but it was something brand new. Well, yeah, when you look at where they were with Armageddon, when you look at how many characters they've introduced, when you look at how they've advanced the plot line, um, you know, they kill characters off, they bring them back in the next one. It, it, it gets hard to keep it going. And at some point, yeah, you, you do kind of need a reboot and you need to start over. Um, I was a big fan of the story mode. That's one thing yeah, I loved. Huge, huge fan of story mode. You can watch awesome. that story mode all day long in Mortal Kombat 9. That I think great. that's that's what distinguishes Nether Realms from their competition, from yeah. Bandai Namco, from Capcom. They know, and especially now with Injustice and Injustice 2 coming out, they are so good now with making a story for a fighting game. They really know how to advance the narrative. Yeah. Um, and, you know, everybody likes to crap all over MK vs. DC. Like, we almost just kind of skipped right past well, it. Well, I mean, that, that's that's like kind of a game that I felt like, again, is an experiment. And I it feel was. like that was more of an experiment that was for, a precursor for, to Injustice. For more reasons than you know. Yeah, exactly. Like, uh, And even then, it was just kind of there. It never just really caught on. But, you know, that story mode that they made was exactly. Mortal Kombat vs. DC. That was sort of the basis for the way story modes exactly. are done in the Mortal Kombat and the Injustice franchise. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and other fighting games haven't really picked up on this. They haven't really figured out how to quite do the story mode the way the NetherRealm team does. Definitely. Um, having said that, there were a few issues that I had with Mortal Kombat 9 story mode. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I-, I thought that if you're going to go back in time, right, mm-hmm. some of the stuff with Sub-Zero and Scorpion didn't really make sense. Like, it shouldn't have undone mythologies, so Scorpion should have understood exactly what happened right yeah. it should have happened the way mythologies happened because raiden didn't go that far back it was time. a little bit inconsistent in some regards yeah and things like cabal was like they made him a cop now or kano they made him an well, informant they made him, i think he was uh he was part of he was originally part of the black dragon i think it was and then like yeah he, he was working with sure. striker in the reboot at one point something like that and then he became a cabal because he got burned some something something along it, those lines. it was so it was strange to me to see that cabal was on the police force. Yeah. And they kind of hinted that he he was a former Black Dragon. Mm. You know? Um, I always remember the Mortal Kombat 3 story. He was a Black Dragon. From the get-go, yeah. Yeah, and then after the invasion happened, he changed sides. He, mm. he realized, hey, this these evil people, like, you know, Kano was from Earth, and yet he's helping these guys attack. So, you know what? I can't be loyal to the Black Dragon anymore. I gotta be loyal to, to Earth Realm now. Yeah. And that was, like, a cool thing for him. So to make him a cop and, and a reformed Black Dragon member already sort of takes away from who he was or who he could have been in the reboot. There's just little minor things like that, you know, minor nitpicking stuff. But overall, overall as a good. game, yeah. I felt like awesome amount of ex- yeah. extras and collectibles and, and stuff. And they got their personalities like... right for yeah. most of the characters. Yeah, big time. And I felt like Johnny was, Cage especially. They, they rebooted a lot of that stuff, and I yeah. felt like they did mm-hmm. it for the better. I think it all worked yeah. out. Again, the narrative worked out good. It was, it was a meaty narrative. It was something you could spend time with and get a lot out of. Yeah. Also, first time in the series, guest characters – Kratos, God of War. I Kratos, mean, yes. That, that, that's a huge deal for the entire Mortal Kombat series because now mm-hmm. also in MKXL, they brought it back again where you have multiple guest characters. You have you have, you have, you have Freddy in the in the, in MK9, then you had yep. Kratos. Now they added, and then now they're adding Jason, Jason the, the Predator, Alien. Alien. Yeah. There's a lot. I mean, uh, the guy from Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Leatherface. Leatherface, yeah, I can't I mean, him. And then there's talk now, at least at some point, about Spawn. You know, stuff there, at least, that, you know, for a time. There was a, there's a lot of, like, potential for that to go even crazier. And I feel like for Mortal Kombat, especially since they're pulling from a lot of horror movies, mm-hmm. that works within the personality of the franchise. That just seems like it meshes so well together. 
Yeah, I think it does. I think the the horror movies, um, you know, especially the action movies, are sort of what Mortal yeah. Kombat borrowed from originally. That's yeah. what we were saying that Mortal Kombat was based on a lot of these old kung fu movies, like. You know, Johnny Cage was based on Jean-Claude Van Damme. You yeah. know, even the initials JC are like the same. Or mm-hmm. Luke Kang came from Bruce Lee. And you can kind of see where the influence was. And now we're, we're sort of drifting. I think the violence and the gore has gotten a little bit more over the top, especially. And better, better the yeah. way it's presented. I think obviously it's still gruesome and it's still crazy and like the type of stuff you could do. But I think that's just the fun of it. And now, well, see, now as a result of all that, I think it does match the horror genre mm. really well. And, you know, there's a lot of Mortal Kombat fans who disagree with the whole guest thing they don't like it they think it's a cash grab or whatever but i think the fact is it's a very um this is shows you how far mortal kombat has come definitely because mortal kombat came out in 1992 Hmm. it's not really that old uh as far as franchises go i mean now since we're in 2017 i mean it's been around for a while as far as it's it hasn't been i don't know if it's been around as long as street fighter i think street fighter was first street fighter was was slightly and i'm not i'm not even counting the the crappy fighting street thing i'm talking straight (laughs) from street fighter 2 onward yeah but like even then i I think that you know it still has a, a good number of years you know and it's a it's a legacy franchise in the game industry it's just been around for so long but when you compare it to other franchises that they're talking with now with uh you know jason and freddy yeah yeah sorry <laughs> no, no but uh what is it um yeah but like when you got like horror icons that are being implemented into it and i think that's you know it's just something that i feel like it worked in the first time around when mk9 and now people want to see more of it and i think that's awesome because the, you could go crazy with what you can implement into the mk series Oh yeah, I mean, there's there's no limit on it, hmm. you know, and it's it's interesting because now with the way uh, with the internet and everything, now there's always constant fine tuning. Hmm. There's always these new uh, patches coming out for balance, Definitely. and and you know, not only just DLC and throwing in new characters like Triborg, yeah, you know, that was cool. Like when Mortal Kombat X first came out, there was no Triborg. They added that in after the fact with Mortal Kombat XL 2017 you know we can do stuff like that now it's really they even neat. had extra story stuff with some of the other DLC characters you know for the combat packs which I thought was awesome because yeah you're who would getting, have thought in a lot of other fighting games especially now Street Fighter 5 being a prime example okay when you get a lot of those content packs or a lot of those downloadable content uh, for characters you don't get that type of stuff you only just get so much at one point bottom line i always felt like you know it was still just so good like how how much you know potential there is there for them to go in all these different places with different characters with the amount of content that you get from downloading these extra characters that adds more story stuff more little cutscenes, more little potential for even they never really did it with mkxl but even adding other extra stories that you could possibly play i would love to see that in like the future franchise which leads to me to my next thing what do we want to see at the future of mk now that mkxl has been around for a while it's out yes. and i think at this point they're moving on at some point because now we got Injustice 2 and stuff. Right. Eventually, and we're going to you know, get that next game. And there's still a lot of support from, from Warner Brothers and NetherRealm for MKX Mobile. Yeah. Which, uh, I don't know if you play that on your phone at all. Not, a, not on my phone. No, I, I know that they needed that to get unlock a couple outfits and stuff. And I was like, okay, eh. I was like, whatever. I was like, what, you know, not my jam. Yeah. Yeah, it's that's not the same game. It's yeah. But, you know, it's the best translation that they could do on, yeah. on such a platform. Um, so going forward, I don't know what to, what to expect next. I thought that with Mortal Kombat X, um, it it also had a really good story mode. It was also really um, engaging. Hmm. Um, the atmosphere was very different. You know, Mortal Kombat the reboot had a lot of vibrant colors. You know, and uh, a lot of skimpy outfits on the women and things Definitely. like that. Yeah. Um, there was a sense that the whole universe had really grown and changed a lot since since Mortal Kombat Nine. I mean, everybody. You know? I, I mean, there's a lot of different changes with that, specifically with the character design, especially the yeah. female characters. That obviously has been a thing that's you know been changing with the game industry and a lot of stuff. Yes. Obviously, in our in our environment now, you know the way society is now. A lot of pressure. From... A lot of that is a product of the times back then. You know, obviously mm-hmm. Sonya Blade being one of the first female characters in the series, if not the first in the series. Yeah. And then obviously you had Katana and Melina right afterwards. Yep. But like just the way that they've looked over the years, like again, just different products of different times. And I feel like now they're still just as you know what they're supposed to be. You know, whether it's sexy whether it's deadly or whatever else those characteristics are still kind of you know exaggerated to some extent but even then i feel like they could even go even further with a lot of that you know you still see that even in injustice the way that they design characters like wonder woman or supergirl now and injustice 2 yes or any of the other characters like that yeah well some of these incredible designs uh you know especially with i think with injustice it's neat the thing they're doing with the armor and how you can kind of customize it and sort of add to the gear mm-hmm. that's what they're calling it right the gear yeah i think it, it, yeah called gear and yeah. in injustice too some yeah. stuff that you get after every single fight right and then obviously you have to pick and choose so as as you amass the gear there's certain things that you're going to be cut off on so you want to choose wisely um 
for Mortal Kombat, I don't think they're going to go quite in that direction. I don't because, want them to, to be honest no, with you. No, no, because you want Injustice and, and Mortal Kombat to be their own things. I don't know. I have a such a tough time. Uh, I would love more stories. I I, I yeah. love the story mode that they built. Yes. I think that's what they do well. They're probably the best at it with this genre in the love industry. It. Always but love it. I would love because Mortal Kombat is such has such a rich and lore and story and all these crazy things that you could get into and you know besides the timeline stuff, which I think is confusing in of itself. Mm-hmm. But like even now that if you're just staying in the rebooted section of the timeline, if you go into like different stories, like. Uh, older stories, you know, of Liu Kang and the Shaolin Temple with Raiden back in the day during that first tournament. Or yeah. Before then, uh, some of the stuff that they did in Shaolin Monks, a lot of the spinoffs, that we, we didn't even really get into it because again, no, that's, a, it. that's a whole ra- rabbit hole <laughs> worth, of sto- worth of stuff. But like some of the stories from like the different side stories, whether it's mythologies, whether it's Shaolin Monks, whether it's Special Forces or all these other different things, there's a lot of stuff that they could implement into the uh, next game. But I would love to see that done in that same type of like approach with like how they did the story mode for MKX. And, like, offer all these different stories where I could just play through and get all that stuff with different characters and such. I think that would be awesome. You know, and that might be the best way to do it. Um, if you think about it, it's very difficult for them to take all the characters and put them in one coherent story mode. They did a pretty good job. I felt like some of the characters, they had to sort of soften and they didn't quite present them in, in, in the way that would, would have been best for them. Hmm. But they did a really amazing job, all things considered. But if they did it the way you're saying, where... Maybe you pick Luke Kang and you have like a Luke Kang side story mode, and then that's it. That's you know, it doesn't have to be this big thing that ties in to this larger story. Um, it, it can just sort of be like a one-off thing where he goes and has his own adventure, and then maybe Sub Zero goes and has his own adventure. They don't necessarily have to intersect, and, and they don't have to be every character. Like I, I understand that it takes a long time to make; it takes yeah. a long time to develop. Obviously, they they go crazy with that big main story mode that they have for everybody. Yeah, and 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 in their defense, in their story modes, you play as just about every character. Plain and simple, True. but but like I would love to see a little bit extra, even if it's as extra DLC. I think that that in and of itself has so much value to it, especially with this style of game. Once you're done everything, and there's a lot to do, and you unlocked everything, giving people even more like that would be amazing. Well, that's one thing I really also thought was great about MKX was in the story mode, you would go up against characters who weren't even in the game, but you know there was enough of them there. There was something there for them to work with, so that you could at least fight against like uh, Baraka, for yeah, example. Yeah, big one. I'm yeah. surprised he wasn't in the in this game, like uh, at least in MKXL. Yeah. Granted, we have the alien who's kind of like he's got a cut Tarkad in style, right? But, but like again, just. You know, as a longtime fan and stuff like that, it was like, you want it so bad. He's just like, please, just give it to me. You know, and, and I was thinking about this. Like, Baraka and the whole Tarkatan race, all of them, they sort of got screwed in Mortal Kombat XL. I mean, mm. there's that refugee camp background where, you know, a portal opens, and if a refugee comes out, they're okay. When Tarkatan step out, bam, capped right in the head. Yeah. You know, and then you've got Aaron Black. And, like, one of his uh, things is he's got, like, a Tarkatan blade that he just picked off of some Tarkatan because that's how tough he is. And it's like, look at this. The, the Tarkatans are getting it from all sides. They're <laughs> it's, getting it it's from... It's like Ed Boon got a thing against Tarkatans now. <laughs> think about it. It's like, he's racist against Tarkatans. Yeah. Like... <laughs> yeah. Alien... Well, they have to deal with Alien now? They have to deal with, like, monsters from another franchise? Like, hey, you're not even in this universe. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's hilarious. But, yeah. But overall, I mean, that that's just, like, some of the other stuff that I would love to see. I would love... Where do you stand on roster size? Because I think... MKXL has a big roster, has a lot yeah, of characters. Yeah, it does. It I think does. it's good. I mean, you could go a little bit more, I feel like, but I know there's always that, that, that potential to get into dangerous territory where you have all these characters and either they feel like palette swaps or they feel like there's not enough you know, diversity between the different movesets and like, yeah. the different styles. Or even, again, where some of the characters start to feel uninspired. Well, you know, now they've got, I think, such a big team, um, the development team, that they can actually sort of fine tune that and they can play test it in a way that they really couldn't before. And I think that, you know, with every game, with every Mortal Kombat installment, the team's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, it started out from just what, like four or five dudes? Yeah. Really just, just all close buddies. True. <laughs> just making something for the hell of it. But, but I mean, like, when you get into that territory, like Armageddon, Armageddon had a huge roster list. And again, the same thing like Ultimate, yeah. Ultimate 3, like, had a huge roster list. And again, yeah. Those trilogy, characters, trilogy, trilogy yeah. another huge roster list. Yeah. Some of those characters were either palette swapped, even though they had their own moves, or they were kind of uninspired, where they controlled very similarly to other characters. It's stuff like that. It's the same thing that people say about Smash Brothers. And like, the big danger, and, and the big danger is that you're going to have one character who's just way too powerful compared to everybody else. Yeah, balance. That's the biggest problem, especially in the competitive market now, where characters uh, tend to be a little bit more kind of you know. 
I want to say, not only just they're given an edge with their play style, it's like the same thing with Street Fighter. The Shoto characters usually are almost always like the top tier or top notch characters of their entire roster. Right. With, with Mortal Kombat, I always felt like, you know, a lot of people went towards like Scorpion, went towards characters where they got combo like crazy and do stuff like that. Again, it gets a little bit more nuanced than how I'm explaining it. Mm-hmm. But but I always feel like, you know, with the bigger roster list, there's more of a potential for that to happen. You can't always put so much detail into every single character when you got 50 plus characters. Well, and that's why... In today, with today's technology, with they're constantly doing patches, they're constantly doing revisions, they can sort of fine-tune that. So if they release something and it turns out that there is a potential issue, they can always kind of get it in the next balance patch, which is nice. Definitely. Um, a question just came in. How do I feel about the new characters like Cassie and Jackie and the new generation? Oh, like the, the, the more original characters? I think that's cool. I, hey, yeah. they need, uh, franchise, when you, the more games that you get and the franchise, the longer that you last, you need that. I feel like you definitely... This, you, Reptile you was never once a part of the franchise originally. Mm-hmm. Reptile became... I mean, he was a secret character. From you the know, beginning. Baraka, yeah. same thing. Uh, right. You need those new characters to keep things fresh and keep people coming back. Well, specifically with that, it's, um, it kind of reminds me... I, I talked to John Tobias at Combat Con. And uh, you can look up that interview on YouTube. Um, basically, John Tobias said that if he had stayed on with Midway after um, after the time he left, he would have liked to have done that sort of game, like Mortal Kombat X style game, where you see the new generation of people. Like, okay, mm-hmm. you know, Jax is getting ready to retire, uh, Liu Kang is getting ready to retire, so now the younger generation is going to pick it up. So you're going to see. It wouldn't have been, obviously, Cassie Cage or Jackie Briggs, but it would have been somebody that John Tobias would have envisioned as sort of the new generation of Earth's heroes stepping up. And I think that characters like that are cool. Um, so you're talking to me earlier about what gen- what would I like to see for the next Mortal Kombat game. Yeah, future of the franchise. So when you take characters like Jackie and, and Cassie, those characters didn't exist in the old timeline. Of course. Yeah. Those, those people exist because Raiden changed time. Mm-hmm. He changed the future. If he hadn't done that... They wouldn't exist. Yeah. Somebody just goes back in time and threatens their existence. That could be the new threat that the Mortal Kombat characters have to deal with going forward. I mean, Somebody, that's interesting, yeah. Well, now that time travel is a thing in Mortal Kombat, um, Quan Chi, I think, knows what Raiden did. And the Elder Gods probably have an inkling of what he did, too. So Shinnok probably knows. There's gonna, people are going to put the pieces together. People are going to figure out, hey, if he can do it, why can't I? I think you get into dangerous territory with that. It's like one of the things I don't like mm-hmm. about storytelling is yeah. time travel stories because I feel like sometimes mm-hmm. they could either be such a big excuse or they can muddy things up so bad. Like when you <laughs> when people when multiple people could start going back in time and changing stuff up, the continuity and logic starts going all over the place for me. It's yep. like it's the Star Trek effect. Star Trek always had those time travel stories where I, I just have such a huge problem with it. But well, see, I'm a big fan of the Flash now. I've been watching. Yeah, the, the Flash. Flash the on, Flash is another one. Like you create Flashpoint. Flashpoint exactly. Like th- there's all these different things with time travel that you could do that for me is a little bit more bad than there's good but there is good there well one of the things i always thought that would be interesting for the future of the franchise is that more so again kind of like what you were saying having a new generation come up you you run into this problem where a lot of people are so nostalgic for their older characters like you can't get rid of your older characters so it's like you yeah. take up space and you can't get newer characters like that yeah. like everybody's going to always want to see scorpion and sub-zero everybody's going to always want to see raiden everybody's going to yep. always want to now at this point johnny cage you know stuff like characters that have really grown in popularity or have been legacy characters of the franchise i think at some point you just have to have that axe button and you have to start you have to start either removing people giving reasons why they're not there and implementing newer characters for people to come in and then obviously dlc and stuff or you have to find the right balance where i feel like the last two games they've had the right balance because of the reboot and everything but now they did really well yeah, yeah with, with especially with mk9 but like at this point now you know as you as they move forward to mk11 or whatever mk11 or 12 is going to be you know that's what's going to be their biggest problem is that how do you move away from some of these other characters and introduce more newer awesome characters well you know i i still think a time travel thing would be cool and even if the start of it, even if the start of it was, hey, the Elder Gods said uh, Raiden interfered, he's forbidden, they, he's, he's being punished, they reset the timeline so it's as if he never did that. Now all of a sudden, uh, Cassie's not there and Jackie's not there and all these people who... Sh- who uh, Should be there. <laughs> or, you know, from the Elder Gods' point of view, shouldn't be there. Mm. Aren't. <laughs> yeah, so it's pretty... It gets to the same territory. But that's narrative-wise, that's character-wise. Yeah. What about mechanics-wise, gameplay-wise? Do you think it should stay how it is because it's no. so good? No? no. You don't think so? <laughs> no, no, no. Well, why is that? Okay, because it drives me nuts that I pick Sub-Zero and then I have to know his Cryomancer state, mm. stance or I have to know one of the other variations of him. Or when I'm Raiden, um, you know, he only has a teleport in one of his things. You want one style. Of fighting, you know, for a character. Because I know this, well, the different styles between the three variations or four variations with Triborg yeah. and stuff. It's yeah. all different. Okay, with Triborg, see, 
he was a character that was sort of came into existence based on the mechanics, hmm. right? Like if we didn't have a character, if we didn't have a mechanic system where you have four variations of one character, then Triborg would never have really been a thing. Hmm. But when you have a, the mechanics are, hey, each character has their own variant. Well, sure, let's make a new character and. Sector is a variant, and Cyrax is a variant, and Smoke is a variant, and then later on Sub Zero is a variant. That makes sense, but it, it, when you know the gameplay sort of drives everything. Hmm. The gameplay drives the story a lot of times, uh, drives the characters, and I think in this case it basically gave birth to a new character. A character like Triborg wouldn't exist in any other Mortal Kombat game because the mechanics don't warrant it. So, uh, so what would you do different then? Would you get rid of the variations? Have one yeah, style per yeah. character? Me personally, I just don't like it. I, I don't like the fact that I have to know different sets of special moves in order to learn a character. That's never been the case. That, that was way too complicated for me. Now, now I know the, the argument for that. I remember when, when MKX was still coming out was that the reason why they did that is because besides the styles that were like a thing back in the past, you mm-hmm. know, some of the older games, and people complain about that too, that, that was also a thing also even when MK9 is like, again, you know, you have like the same character like in that mirror match. Even though, you know, it was the same styles or whatever, it, those matches could get boring. Now if you have the, st- the variations, you could pick one of three, there's always those mirror matches could always still be different. Different. They could always still be like different styles, different approaches. Yeah. That character instead of just being the exact same thing all the time. Yeah. At least it, that's one argument I can understand, but I get it from your point of view. Is like, listen, that could get a little bit too complicated. Oh, and, and you know, not to change the subject, but when you were talking about the mirror matches and stuff, isn't it funny that we haven't used the term mirror match in Mortal Kombat since Mortal Kombat One, and yet everybody still calls it that to this day? Yeah, I think everybody still does. Yeah. yeah for, for any fighting game, again, it's 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 pretty. Yeah. Mortal Kombat invented that term, but um, it, it's just crazy to me. Like. 20 something years later we're all still saying hey it's a mirror match yeah. and we all know it, what it, it is it makes sense yeah, yeah. that lingo that, that fighting game lingo so yeah any other final thoughts about MK just in general as we wrap up um, yeah I think that Mortal Kombat um, you know, going back to the very first question that you asked me is like how is Mortal Kombat um, what, you know, what, what has it done for me yeah uh, I think Mortal Kombat made me the man I am today I think um, like when I first got into the internet this was I think Mortal Kombat 3 was just coming out into the arcade. I was mm-hmm. going on the internet for the first time. We had This is back in the dial-up days, so crazy, crazy long time ago. Um, that was how I sort of got into computers. That was sort of how I... I when, you know, when the Mortal Kombat movie first came out, there was that little... Uh, there was that poster with Goro, and it said www.mortalkombat.com forward slash combat begins. And it's like, yeah, that's what I need. I need the internet so I can go to mortalcombat.com, combat begins. Mm. And then once I got it, it's like, cool. But then I would go online and find out there's a whole community of people. Mm. Now, um, I don't know if, how long you have been on the internet for. I don't know how a long. A while. Yeah. <laughs> Too long. Now I'm dating myself. Well, some of these guys, don't, <laughs> some of these guys might not know this. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, young there, there used to be like four, five, six hundred different Mortal Kombat fan sites. I'm not exaggerating. This is before social this media. This is the Wild West of yeah. the internet <laughs> back it, in the day. No, and it was amazing. Like, and, and none of these sites really felt like it was just a carbon copy of every other site. Every, everyone seemed to have something unique. Like, there would be a guy who made fake pictures, and that was just... You looked at... and He was just, that guy. <laughs> yeah, he's the fake picture guy. Uh, or some other guy would just collect, like, a bunch of fan fictions. Hmm. And it's like, maybe he writes his own, too, but he would, like, have a, a huge collection, like, a huge archive of fans who all wrote their own stories for the game. There would, like, hundreds of stories, hmm. you know, that he would amass in this collection. And there was just tons of things like that where some guy would have the moves, some guy would have the combos. Um, everybody just had, you know, one guy would have like really amazing looking graphics. I don't know if you remember this guy, Cookie Man. But, no, I don't, I don't remember. <sighs> never heard that before. Okay, well, you know Rat.org, right? You know, Rat.org, no. Uh, okay. Never heard of it. There's just ton, tons of all, his, his site's still around. But um, just so many people out there. Now we have like maybe six or seven real big fan sites. We've got Mortal Kombat Online, which is who I'm affiliated with. Um, you know who I've I used to be a correspondent for that site. I'm still a realm ambassador, still a friend of MK Online. TRMK, love that site. Uh, Total Mortal Kombat, Kami Dogu, MK Secrets. I just want to give a shout out to everybody, and I'm sorry if I didn't mention your site out there, but there's there's still a few out there. You yeah, know, there's a big community of people. There's just everybody doing their own thing. Yeah, point, so. yeah, basically. But now every now the big thing is just have a YouTube channel. That's yeah, it. You don't need exactly. to have, have a personal site or, or even a Twitter. A yeah, social media, Facebook, social media. Facebook page. Yeah, like, you know, now things have changed. Obviously, you know, yeah, having a, a personal fan too. site is not really the way that a fan would um, show their love for MK. But that's one thing I did back in the day. You know, I started up the Combat Pavilion and I got into web design and you know I learned all these little tricks and, and computer tricks and things like that, all for Mortal Kombat. That's that's, that's cool. how I got into that whole thing. That's good. Um, so someone was asking me, um, what do I think about seeing a new movie? 
I think we're going to get a new movie at one point because we had so. the, the web series. I know. Yeah. And the same guy doing the web series, eventually he's going to do a movie. I think there was a story at one point where he got a deal. I don't know. If, I thought maybe he it. dropped out. See, I don't know what I the know, latest is. Nothing's happened for so long. That's the problem. It's just like, it I, happened, I remember yeah. when, the, when the second season of that, Mortal Kombat Legacy, Legacy came out, yes. that was a big deal. People said a bunch of different stuff. Yes. And it was like, okay, movie's happening now. Okay, where is it? And it's been like, what, like two years, I think, now at this point. Yeah. And nothing's happened. Yeah, and it's funny because there's always been rumors of a Mortal Kombat 3 movie, especially yeah. um, the, back then people were calling it Mortal Kombat Domination, and they, they swore there'd be a Mortal Kombat Domination. After that second movie, I don't, I don't know about that. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> that, that was not one of those things that, that, that warranted that. <laughs> I mean, the first movie was good, though. I yeah. mean, it was okay, but what it was, it was fun. Yeah, I'm a fan of the first one. I mean, the second one, no. They killed Johnny Cage in like the first five, ten minutes. Okay, now, now, now I got a problem, like... Oh, dude. <laughs> that, like, that, was, like, that, that was just rude. <laughs> like, straight up. But, but Well, you know, they, but that was following kind of the storyline of the game. True. Like, that true. part of it. Um, it. I think it was just, they were trying to do too much. They were trying to squeeze too many characters. It was the roster size. That's yeah. what killed Mortal Kombat. Yeah, exactly. The roster size. Pretty much. Too but, big of a roster. Nice. So, so with that being said, though, any other final, like, shout-outs that you have, you know, right before uh, anything else? For oh, um, well, you know, actually, there's someone else just asked another question. Mm. Um what kind of guest characters or DLC would I like to see going forward? And, uh, yeah, this is probably going to make me unpopular out there, but as a nod to Mortal Kombat vs. DC, which was mm-hmm. an amazing uh, compliment for Mortal Kombat that it's really being accepted to, to kind of go toe-to-toe with these 70-plus-year franchises like Superman and Batman, mm-hmm. um, I think a Superman or Batman cameo would be kind of cool. Well, since it's under WB Games, I think it's realistic. It's easy. I mean, they had an Injustice Scorpion makes an appearance. And I think, exactly. I think also there's going to be another one in Injustice 2. They said it was going to be Scorpion, and some people kept saying it was going to be Sub-Zero. And, you know, Kano play. made a cameo in one of the Batman Arkham games, yeah, too. Yeah, you know, so, stuff like that. I so mean, it doesn't even have to be like a full-fledged guest character, but uh, maybe some kind of a nod to that, just some kind of saying, hey, that happened. Even then, I would I wouldn't be I wouldn't have a problem with it. I think it'd be fun. I think it'd be weird. I don't think with DC in the way that they are, they would let their character be killed. That's probably that's probably one of the only things like why number one MK versus DCU didn't do so well because you couldn't kill the other the DC characters. Yeah. There's no way DC was going to allow that. That's just the semantics of it. And, and, and like, you, know, you know the crazy part is if you pay attention to the story mode when Flash first gets taken over by the Rage, mm-hmm. you know from Dark Khan. Uh, they're like, hey, Flash isn't supposed to kill. He's like, well, now he does. Oh, wow. But he doesn't. But he doesn't. No. <laughs> he doesn't straight up. He just said he would. But but like that, that's something like, that would be the only thing that I would see that would work against that. Because, well, and it's really DC. Yeah. That, that's, that, that's really, I don't think the guys in NetherRealms or even WB really have a problem with that. It's more DC holding the integrity of their characters. But, you know, they had the death of Superman in the comics. Yeah, exactly. Like, characters in the comics die all the time. And they come back. And they come back, too. But 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 even then, I they feel like... They had Batman rest in peace. They true. had that whole storyline. But, but it's like one of those things where I feel like, you know, when people identify with those characters, people know Batman doesn't kill. Superman doesn't kill. That's their moral thing. But even... Even then, I feel like now, at some point, you know, comic fans have grown up. They, they've mm-hmm. matured and such. Mm-hmm. I think that, especially now with the movies, DC, uh, EU, with all the different films that have been coming out, there's a more darker overtone. And now Batman kills. For no and, pro- and Superman. And Superman they kills. All, now everybody kills. <laughs> you know, I, I think at yeah. some point, hopefully, they're a little bit lax on that. But that's the only real thing that I see that's a problem. Well, you know, going back to what you said, like a lot of the fans, um, a lot, especially a lot of the younger people, are getting into these superheroes now from the movies. They maybe know these last couple of Zack Snyder movies better than they know the comics themselves. So, kind of makes sense that maybe uh, they could allow a killer Superman or a killer Batman. Cool. Cool. Sounds dope. So, where can everybody find you? Where can everybody find you on YouTube? Twitter? Yes. Okay, you can look me up on Twitter. You can look me on up on YouTube. I'm Tabmock99. That's Combat Backwards. So, T-A-B-M-O-K-99. Uh, I also have a little site called the Combat Pavilion, mm-hmm. uh, which used to be a lot more active a few years ago. I used to collect all the fans' comics and animations and all kinds of fun stuff. But I'll still use it to um, share my YouTube videos and once in a while maybe something else too. So that's YouTube, that's Twitter, that's Tom, Tom, bleh. <laughs> Tom, yeah, it's all tongue twisted. Tom, Tom, bleh. All right, tab mock. <laughs> tag mock. <laughs> yeah. So you're the not used to twisted. saying it. The tongue twisted. You're not used to it. Tab mock 99 on Twitter, on YouTube. Okay, that's uh, your website. Uh, anywhere else that they can find you, or those are the main spots? That's can, probably about you're, it. You're posting up on YouTube a lot because yeah. you've been posting up a lot lately on your YouTube channel. Then obviously you've been tweeting. You know, yes, all the always, stuff, always so, have to tweet. So that's that's pretty cool. So, but thank you for chatting, MK, with me. That's pretty awesome. It's great. Hey, to it was great you. to have you here. It was just thank pretty you. awesome. I really appreciate it. So again, guys, let me know in the comment section what you guys think. So put your favorite MK characters. Put your 
questions, comments, concerns, whatever, in the comment section. Leave me a like on this video and subscribe to the channel. We will talk to you guys again very soon. Peace out and stay epic, everybody. See ya.